Okay, and uh, we are on air from London, from our brand new studio in Campus London. And this is the first edition of this EMEA version of our Google Plus platform office hours. Uh, we will repeat, uh, so uh, stay tuned on the Google Plus developers page to see our upcoming uh, events. I have a public service announcement. Uh, unfortunately, we had a last minute problem, so we are not able to have external guests. Uh, because unfortunately we wouldn't be able to have the audio in, uh, we will fix this and next time we will have a lot of external guests for our session. So let's start. Um, I will introduce uh, the studio. Uh, on my left we have Adel Schre. And on my right, Ian Baba. Hi. Uh, and I'm Silvano Luciani. Uh, I'm a developer programs engineer on the Google Plus platform. Ade is a developer advocate. Uh, and so is Ian. Uh, the topic of this of our first EMEA session is the history API, and we will see a very cool app that Ian developed uh, using the history API and Go on App Engine. Uh, but first, an introduction to the history API, and who better than Ade for this task? Thank you. So I think you've all played with history, you've all taken a look at it, and it's trying to solve a number of problems. But we're trying to solve it in a very googly way. So the first thing is, how does a user sign in Google Plus? So we give you a signing button. You click on it, it takes you to the standard OAuth flow, and the user sign in. And then once this has happened, you get an API that lets you insert what we call moments, which are activities, into a private place we call history. The thing we're trying to do here is we're trying to separate saving moments from sharing moments. If you think of it like instant upload, when you take a photo, it gets instantly uploaded to a private album, and then you choose if you want to share it. And some of them you may want to share, some of them you may not want to share. So if you're looking at my stream, you'd have seen I just shared a photo I took of my shoes and Ian's shoes. It was pretty good, so I shared it. There were a couple of other photos that weren't so good, and I didn't share those. So that's the insight behind instant upload. And we took the same insight and we took it to history. We said, well, what if people had a right to APIs on Plus? What would they do with it? Well, they'd want to write moments, which are activities with specific types. And then the user would choose, well, this thing happened on this third party site that was interesting. Do I actually want to share this? And if it's sufficiently magical, then the user would share that magical moment with their friends, their circles. If it isn't, they wouldn't but it would still be there for the user to find later on. So that's what we're trying to do with history. It's signing, saving moments, and then choosing to share if the user feels it's valuable. I think that's the heart of the bus history. Yeah, well, which one? Yeah. yeah, so I, I think that's that's exactly it, this, this ability to keep these moments in this sort of private place and then choose what to do. So in the same way as all of you have looked at the moments and looked at what's been going on. Uh, we have to understand how they can be used and how you can build things with them. So to do that, I actually decided to put together a uh, simple application that has been uh, used to allow you to have a to-do list on uh, uh, the push. What we have here is something that's running on App Engine. It just gives you a place in which you can to-do list. And as you create items and check them off, it pushes them into history. Uh, so we can go on here and say an important task that I have to do. Um, Mark, can you just select the uh, main screen there so people can see the main screen? Okay, thank you. So this is just the uh, screen that, uh, this is just uh, the, the interface that's there. We can go in, we can create items, and they'll appear. Um, and you can check them off, of course, when they're done. So I can go here and, and close off the Hello World. Nothing particularly special about that. And we'll have a look at how that's built in a second. But the sort of interesting thing is that this is then going to push into your Google Plus history. And then you can go back and uh, either share those moments out if they were interesting for you, or just kind of have that archetype of things that have been going on. So if we bounce into my Google Plus history, it takes sometimes a, a little while, and you'll notice this if you're building something yourself. It can take a minute, two minutes sometimes, for an actual moment to appear in the history UI, the preview UI, once you've written a moment in there. Let's see if something turns up. 
If not, we'll jump into the code and come out later. Ah, there we are. So um, we've just got some uh, a task that's been uh, added in here. And if I share that, it's actually got the, the description of the task. So that's pretty straightforward. But how that's actually being built uses a few different elements from history. It uses the history API itself. It uses schema.org. And it uses the, the kind of underlying code that we wrote from Go. So I think it might be cool to jump into some code now and uh, take a look. So this is kind of an introduction to multiple different things. Um, because this was built using the history APIs. This was built on Google App Engine. And this was built using Go, which I know are all three kind of not necessarily things you anyone would use before. So hopefully, I'll, I'll give you an idea of how they work. And particularly, we'll jump through some of the functions that have done some of the more interesting stuff to give you an idea. Almost all of the code from here will be, well, all the code from here, will be posted up onto code.google.com into the repositories that all the other office hours uh, are in. So if we go down um, looking at the file, everything in this case is included in just one big Go file, one big Go package called to do that is doing all of the work. Just makes it easier to, to look through. And we actually declare just three types up front, one for our to do item, one for our to do list, and which is a list of items and one for our uh, individual users. And the real work, uh, and a good example of the real work is being done in the home function here. So in our init, we set up a handler for the different paths that we're doing. Much like with any other web framework, we have to route a certain path to a certain bit of code. So we're routing the uh, main route of the domain onto our home function. In our home function, we're actually going to go through and we're going to offer the OAuth URL to allow people to authenticate themselves. We're going to handle a response for that. And when we handle a response from that, we're going to go away and we're going to pick up the user's profile information so that we can display it. So the first thing that we do when we come in, you'll see we create a new App Engine context here. Whenever you're dealing with App Engine, the context is kind of that central point that gives you access to the various APIs and functionality that it gives you. App Engine, because of the way it scales and because of the functionality it offers isn't quite like hosting something just on uh, a straightforward web server. You have to make sure that you're using its functionality in order to uh, get the best out of it. So what we do when you first appear is down here, if we've got no existing user, so if there's no user ID, we just extract the auth code URL from the OAuth library. So this is using the GoAuth2 library, which uh, is available uh, for Go. And that just generates based on the config that comes out of our developer console. So once we've set up an OAuth context with our client ID, with uh, our client secret, and with the various redirect URLs, just as with any other OAuth situation, we'll be able to generate an auth code URL, which we're going to use for our sign-in link. When we send the user off to that, they'll get prompted to authenticate the application if they haven't already. And then they will be redirected back to us here, where we can actually take the code and exchange it for a user token. Now, if you see here, where we have the OAuth transport, we actually have to set this up for App Engine to use the URL fetch mechanism. Because once we're on production App Engine, all URL fetches actually go through an API and go out to be rate controlled and to be quota controlled so that we don't have rogue applications going crazy and spamming a whole bunch of stuff. So we actually need to pass in a new transport, and we pass in our config, which contains our client ID, our client secret, and so on. Then we exchange our code for an OAuth token. And that's the token we can actually use to go away and make calls to the Google Plus API. For the actual calls themselves, we just extract the client from the GoAuth2 library. That gives us back a HTTP client we can use to make the calls, and we pass that into our Google Plus service. So right at the top here, we're including a two different Google Plus services out of the Google Plus client libraries. Uh, sorry, the Google client libraries. We have the uh, Plus V1 library, and we have the Plus V1 moments library, uh, which I've just aliased to Plus history here. The reason we have two libraries is that the V1 moments library, which is the library for history, is actually still in developer preview. So that isn't going to work for most of the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, access. The regular APIs are in v1. So we actually need both in this case, because we're going to be accessing some regular profile information, and we're going to be going away and accessing history. So once we have uh, our new service, we create a new 
uh, new OAuth client, sorry, we create a new plus service using that OAuth client, and we use the people get method. Uh, that's going to go away and do a call to the RESTful APIs and just return the profile information for the user described as me. Because we're wrapping that in the OAuth context, that's going to go away and get your current, the current logged in user, their information. And what we're actually going to do with that is use that as both the key for our cookie, and we're going to store that information in a memcache instance so that we can display the uh, profile information at the top here. So as we say, my to-dos and show my picture, that's going, to be, that's going to have been retrieved from that profile and stored here. We do that very straightforward way. We just create a new user entry, which we'll use through the rest of the application. And we're going to marshal that into JSON. So memcache stores a byte array. It doesn't store a kind of arbitrarily structured document. So to serialize it, we're just going to stick it into, into JSON and uh, turn that into a byte array. We can pull out the structure back into a user entry struct just by using the unmarshal function, which you can actually see in the, the get user. We'll hop into there in a second. Memcached itself, we just have a struct called item, which has the key and value, and we set that into the uh, memcache library. So that's going to go away. It's going to store that value against that key in memcache, uh, allow us to retrieve it later. And we're going to use the key as the value for our cookie. So the key in this case is actually just uh, an MD5 of the user's profile with a, a little salting string just to make it slightly less guessable. There's also a lot more you could do here to get yourself a secure ID or just generate a UUID. There's no real need for this to be linked to the rest of the user's profile in any way. It was just simpler uh, for knocking up some quick code to use the profile ID as the base. So once we've done that, we create a cookie struct, which again has just a value and a name. You can also set expiry times and similar in here. And we use the HTTP library to set the cookie. And the situation we end up with is that the OAuth token, the user's name, the user's profile, is all stored in memcache for when we return. And this means that we can send that cookie back to the user with the response. And the response includes the whole HTML of the page, which is generated down here through this home template execute. So Go comes with a built-in templating language that is pretty proficient, allows you to do most of the normal tasks that you would in a template. This is the main HTML. So you can see it's mostly just regular HTML. The template tags are identified by the uh, double curly brace. That is either going to output a token. So in this case, where you see I'm doing double curly brace user in the URL, that's just going to output the value of user in the URL. Or there's certain keywords you can use, like if, which is going to check for if the value is empty, um, uh, or if the value is not empty, then it'll execute the included condition. And you can do else and so on. Templates also allow you to include other templates. So you can structure your document how you'd like to. So down here, where we have the sign in URL, which is displayed when the user's not logged in. When they are logged in, we actually display the list of items. So that's this work, home, and any items that they have entered into there. And that's actually stored in a list HTML file, which you can bounce into here, that just uses a loop over lists we have given it. So it's using the range function twice, once for each list, so home, work, and so on, and once for the items within the list, which again includes a sub-template. So it's very easy to nest templates this way. One thing to notice, if you want to do that, is that all of them have to be within this template that we're executing. So if I just hop down to the, the bottom here, when we actually define those templates, we need to make sure that we include the others in them. So we have here our home template, where we're passing in the main HTML file. And we're actually using home template again to pass in the list and the entry templates. That means that they're all available to that template to be executed. Otherwise, what will happen is when it tries to go and include the template and execute it, it'll actually fail because we haven't created it in there. So it's important to make sure that any sub-templates you want to use are available for referencing by that main template. So if we just bounce up to the main now, this gets us to a situation where we have the list of items actually created, and we can then see them, and the user has the ability to add more. The main work of adding and removing items is done in JavaScript. So when we load up our actual page, we create some handlers on the 
uh, item boxes and the item entry boxes, and on the little X button allows you to delete. So what we do is just associate uh, this function here, add to do, um, which is going to go away and just do an AJAX post over off to our uh, web service where it will create the item, or it will do a post off to delete the item. So the posts are very simple, just using, in this case, it's jQuery, just either adding an LI to the screen with the response from the add post, or fading out and removing the LI if we have no longer if we no longer need it once we've completed that. So in Go, those again are just extra handlers that we define here. So we've got um, two, manage list and manage item. Um, and those functions are a little bit simpler. If we look at uh, manage uh, list to begin with, Manage list, it looks for posting a new item, uh, pulls some form values out, so these are the posted values, and then at the end it's going to just redirect back to the location of the item. And so this is the first kind of interesting bit where we come into thinking about history, as here is the point at which we want to actually push a moment to history. So if a user's created an item, we'd like to actually update the Google Plus history and tell it about it. But we also would like to you know, return the item to the user. So if the user, uh, when the user gets redirected, they get sent to a URL that is specific to an item. And that URL, if we see down here, will render using uh, the item template. And that is uh, entry here. So we're going to return an li that just has a description of the thing, it has the close button, but it's a snippet. It's not a fully formed piece of HTML. If we request without the XML HTTP request header set, which means if we're requesting like through a normal web request, we're actually going to use a different template, and we're going to uh, render the moment plus, which is going to render a full page. And in that page, we're going to include schema.org markup. Can you guys want to cover what schema.org markup is? Sure. I think if you want to understand schema.org, you have to start by first of all understanding what is what are microformats. So microformats start as a very simple idea. You have a well written HTML web page and it describes some product, some entity, some person. And then you realize that it's really hard for tools to automatically understand the structure of that page. But then you realize after a while that you kind of use certain very common tag names. And so the microformats community realized they could embed these attributes in the HTML, which didn't change the appearance of the page, but which surfaced the fact that this page actually contains a local business, or contains a person, or contains a place. And Schema at all came along as an attempt to say, well, instead of having lots and lots of different kinds of microformats, what if you had one ontology, one set of microformats, or, or microdata in this case, which lets you say, this is a person, this is a place, this is a special kind of place, this is a local business, this is a school, this is a high school. And if you made this ontology extensible, so people could start to the mailing list and say, I'd like to add this kind of entity into this hierarchy, you get a really nice thing. The beauty of this is that at the simplest, all you need to do is to say, this page describes a thing which has a name, a description, and an image, and a URL so we can know what page it's on. Done. That's the simplest way. And the beauty of this is that it gives you control over the snippets you see in web search, but it also gives you control of the snippet that is shown in your stream in Google+. And coincidentally, it also gives you control of the snippet that's shown in Google+, history. Absolutely. Cool. So we could just uh, put it back to the code. So the um, what you can sort of see here, if I can ah, go on to debug that a little bit bigger. Um, when we go and request the URL, when we add a type, the URL that we get back just contains this LI because we did it with the XML HTTP request. But when we do it just from a browser, we get a screen like this, which is a fully rendered page. And that is where we are using the markup as. Um, as they described, to indicate what this page is. Now, uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a terrible thing for people that uh, do a lot of schema.org and using schema.org slash thing, because I didn't know exactly what a to-do list was in our structure. So normally, you'd want to do something a lot more precise. Person, you'd do a uh, 
um, a creative work, you can do a blog post, whatever it is that you're actually covering. This is the most generic and worst possible thing you can use in schema.org. But I am indicating that, OK, the body of this document is an item scope of this type. And within it, there are some certain properties that I have. So I have a name item prop, which I'm using as a task to do. I have a description, which in this case is the text of the task, like it is a mere office hours. And I have an image. So again, item prop image here indicates that this image best describes this thing. And if it was a person, the image would be of the person. That way. So that allows, even though this markup doesn't affect how the page is rendered, it, as Ade says, allows search, it allows sharing to pick up those characteristics from this HTML page. So if I push them into history, this is what the history will retrieve. So if we take a little look at that, where in the create function we have this push moment, what we're sending across is um, the uh, user. So it's push the, the delete. Um, what we have we send across is the user, the URL. So that will be the equivalent of this, um, and the type of the moment. So when you are creating a moment in Google Plus history, you're not just saying this URL happened. You're saying that the user took some kind of action. The user has done something. And there's a list of eight or nine supported. Uh, yes. I think we, have, we support a small set of common actions right now. The important thing is that the user performs some action on the entity at this URL. Yeah, That's the important idea. So all of them are documented in, our, uh, in the API documentation in here. Um, and you can find out everything you need to know. Nine. Nine. It's nine. nine. Yeah. So in this case, because you're creating a new thing to do, I decided to mark that as a create activity. Let me just jump down to the, the push moment code here. Um, what this is going to do is, again, it's going to use OAuth. So we need to set up another transport, and we need to get our token. So we're pulling the token that we have in our user entry, which will normally be coming out of memcache. And we're creating a uh, OAuth token there. And we're using the client that we retrieve from the OAuth library for our plus history service. Then we need to actually create what we're going to send to the plus history service. So that is a moment, which is defined as a moment struct. And at its most basic level, the moment has a target and it has a type. The type is, the, in this case, the create activity that I decided upon earlier. And the target is the URL that we're going to reference. It's the thing that the user is doing something to. In this case, the user has created this URL. So we're going to pass through a item scope, which is the struct that is used for that. But we're only going to set the URL in it. There's a lot of values in there you can set. But the only one you want to set at this time is the URL. That's the, the place you're referring to. And then we just use the moments insert where we're just going to say, uh, for the user me, the currently logged in OAuth user, to the vault, which is the only place you can send them to. Uh, that's the, the one valid field for that collection. Uh, we're going to send this moment, and we're going to do it. And that is going to go away, and it's going to push the moment over to Google Plus History, where uh, it will appear, as we saw it earlier, just in here, like this. And there, users can reshare it. So it's picked up the image. That's the image that was marked on it. It's picked up the text that was described, and it's picked up the title. And uh, possibly we even have the, the one I just had it. Don't know. Not quite yet. Oh, yeah. A mere office hours. So that's the description, the title, and the image have been pulled out via schema.org from that. Now, if we go back to here, once this has been done, we're, we're pretty much done with the, the OAuth part of this situation. This is uh, all we're using it for in this case is to just continually push those moments. But that would have happened sometime after the user has logged in. So because we're storing this stuff into memcache, we can keep it. And then as the user comes back and interacts with the site, we create the moments in the background. We're not asking them for authentication again. We're not uh, checking on them again unless that token has expired, unless we need extra privileges from them. So this is something that works well for a kind of application situation. One thing that we did realize, or I did realize, as sort of building this application, that there is a slight fundamental mistake about how we've actually structured the idea of this, this app, my to-do app. And it's a point Ade made, which was when you're using history, the best possible use is for private actions, the user taking a private action, but on a public URL. 
And in this case, the URL is kind of semi-public. We have to have this thing as a public URL that anyone can go to, but it's not really public information. It's not really something that the user would be best suited to do. So I think um, one example of that would be if we were to make a post where it got written to history that Ade has checked into Google Campus London. Google Campus London is a big building, so it's pretty public. It's seven stories in the heart of East London. The fact that I'm here is private, except for all of you watching right now. <laughs> So absolutely, I think I, that's a really good point. And I think that when you're designing your own applications, that's something to keep in mind. What's the public thing that is being interacted with privately by the user? Even if the user isn't necessarily particularly worried about it being private, like at a checking in here while well, I've chosen there, to share, but the he fact. chooses to share it exactly. So the information starts private, and the user then chooses whether they want to share it. But the thing that is actually being interacted with, it's best if that is public and that has a URL. And that benefits, uh, that benefits you in a lot of ways. Because if your URLs are public, then, and you might not have a schema.org, then they're going to share well, they're going to look good, but they're also going to appear in search well, because you've got that uh, extra markup on there. So the other interesting thing that sort of came out from the application is worth just a very quick look, is that when I actually started on this, just to get something working, I actually started on this in uh, JavaScript. So rather than using the server side flow, I did it in the client side flow. Still using uh, Go and App Engine to provide the sort of back end story, but doing all of the URL uh, moments work in uh, JavaScript. So it's interesting to compare the two. It is very simple and very consistent across the different languages. So I just check out the master there. Oh, no. Uh, get stashed there. Um, and then we go bounce back in here then what we see is that rather than pushing those moments in the uh, Go part of the service, we're actually going to push them in the JavaScript. So here's where we store the item. Very, very similar. Rather than we're going to pull out the URL of the actual item, which was being returned in a, uh, a special response header, and we're going to create a moment just using JSON. So obviously, that's pretty easy to work with in JavaScript. We just create the type here, the create activity, and we add the URL in as the target. And then down here in this push moment function, all we're going to do is do a call, very simple call, using the Gappy um, library, off to the plus v1 moments vault, posting the JSON representation of the moment that we're passed in. So this is very similar to how we were doing it before. All we're doing is taking the JSON representation of the moment and sending that over to Google Plus using the OAuth setup. So there we have setting the token into the auth on the Gappy library. And we just make a Gappy client request to actually go and execute that. So you'll find once you've actually implemented the history API or any of the API in one language, it's really easy to then go and turn that into another language. This was not that complicated to go and look from the G plus client code and turn it into the uh, code for the Go Google API client. And it's the same looking at our clients in PHP, Ruby, Java, and any of the other right. languages. So like, given your double experience with both the server side mm -hmm. flow and the client side flow, first one with Go, second one with JavaScript, mm -hmm. uh, which would you suggest like, to use to our user? Uh, which one you think it's more appropriate for, you know, like it's it's a, it's a really good question. I think that the differences are going to depend on the different kind of application. So if you are building something that is more of a web application where you are having longer running interaction happening in the background, so it's storing something for user, they're coming back and interacting with it occasionally. Doing the work at the server side just gives you a lot more flexibility. The user doesn't have to be using the app right then when you write the moment. So if you know that they're going to do something, uh, they go and do it, you get a signal from somewhere else, you can still trigger that moment even if they're not there with you. If you do it in the browser and JavaScript, then they pretty much have to be running that application at the time for you to go away and push the moment. So it depends on the kind of service that you want to offer the a user. But that's always the thing to focus on is what's the user going to actually see? Why would they want me to be pushing this moment? And then once you know that, go back and work out which technology would be the best basis for you. You should also think about what happens in a mobile context where I may sign into the web app, and mm -hmm. then I may be using your mobile app, and then something may happen, and 
you can decide whether your mobile app is going to actually write straight to history from my phone or whether it's just going to tell your server and then your server is going to write the history on my behalf. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I think you, you've got that option um, to do it either way around. You can, you can post from the mobile client libraries or you can uh, take from the server side. Definitely worth considering. OK. Cool. I mean, I do have one question. Sure. Yeah. In the, oh, no, well, exactly. <laughs> We've got a very big team now in Europe. And there's four <laughs> of us, so it's, you know, it's starting to get confusing. So where did you get those icons? Ah, these icons are, it's, that's a very good point. I, mean, I should have I should have mentioned that earlier. So these icons are actually from a brilliant project called the Noun Project. Uh, this is a collection of a variety of useful and interesting icons that have been, uh, oh, um, that have been uh, released as Creative Commons. So you can go on there, and as long as you uh, give the proper attribution to the creators, you can use any of these icons. They've got a great search. And you'll find in a lot of cases there's multiple variants for any given icon. So you can find one that really sort of matches uh, the style of, of your um, product. But really great source for finding nice little icons and descriptive images. I do love the bicycle one. <laughs> I can see there's some really interesting things you could do around that. There, there it, is, it is fantastic. And uh, I, I definitely uh, enjoy having, having access to, to all of those, including, of course, the ever important unicorn. Yeah. yeah. So why did you choose unicorns for Everest? It was the best icon I could think of at the time with limited searching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have another question actually, mm -hmm. like about um, you have a lot of experience with different languages, and I'd like to hear like after this what you think about Go. What did you like about writing in Go? Is there something that you know was? I think I think Go is. Um, it's, it's strange. It's kind of different from other languages that I've worked with more recently, where a lot of the languages that uh, I've tried more recently have been pushing down certain paradigms around, say, you know, functional programming or extremely object-oriented programming and, and that kind of thing. I think Go is, in many ways, it's very simple. That background as a systems language has made it just incredibly easy to just kind of write code and have it work well. In this case, I didn't need to use any of the concurrency primitives and some of the stuff that really makes Go different. But I found just as a language that gives you that kind of C feel, but with a, from pretty much none of the pain that comes with C, uh, I found it very pleasant to work with. And uh, the documentation online is excellent. It is quite tricky to search for it because the language is called Go. So if you search for Go and almost anything, it's, it's going to be difficult to find a result there. But if you can get into the documentation, which is just on Golang, uh, it's it's really, really good. And there's a great community out there that have been very helpful when I've had problems. Okay. Do you have any other question, Adit? I, no, I think this pretty much covers it all. Okay. I'm watching the our event, and I can see any question from external users. Uh, so um, I would like, uh, Ian, would you like remind that we will publish this code? Yes. We'll... Yeah. Yeah. We'll be putting this up. It'll be. We'll put the links up uh, on the on the page afterwards. But it'll be in the same repository as all the other office hours samples from uh, previous weeks from the uh, the US variant. Okay. And uh, just another reminder is that as Ian mentioned and Ali as well, the Google Plus History API is in developer preview. So like, if you want to use the API and see the user interface for the moments that Ian has shown us. Uh, you need to sign up for the preview, and you can do it at developers.google.com slash plus slash history slash preview. Um, any? I think that pretty much covers it. Although I would say, if you try history, you should really play around with some of the search stuff we've done with that. It's really quite clever. And give us feedback. Absolutely. If you try. And if you have any questions, we have a, a mailing list. Yeah, and forums and Stack Overflow and. You can always talk to us on Plus. Yeah, and, and, office. <laughs> and Office Hours. And Office Hours. Yeah. So um, to close, uh, I'd like to say uh, thanks for coming, thanks for watching us, and thanks if you're watching this recorded on YouTube. Uh, next time, we will have interacting guests. And next time, it will be probably two weeks from now. We are still uh, trying to determine which is the best schedule. So if you have any feedback about the airing time today, please let us know uh, because we will take it into con uh, consideration because we are trying, as I said, 
to see which is the best time to serve EMEA. And uh, thanks, Are. Uh, thanks, Ian, for showing your app. And see you in two weeks. Bye bye.